Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Begin with a quotation that I've shared with you before um, from St. Sophronius, Bishop of Jerusalem, writing about uh, the, the life of St. Mary of Egypt. And we've spoken about St. Mary of Egypt in the past here at the Institute, so I won't tell her story before again, but I will share with you the opening words of that beautiful text uh, as maybe a, uh, a bridge between what I said earlier and, uh, and, and the lives of the twelve apostles and their stories. The text begins like this. It is good to hide the secret of a king, but it is glorious to reveal and preach the works of God. So said the archangel Raphael to Tobit when he performed the wonderful healing of his blindness. Actually, not to keep the secret of a king is perilous and a terrible risk, but to be silent about the works of God is a great loss for the soul. And I, says St. Sophronius, in writing the life of Mary of Egypt, am afraid to hide the works of God by silence, remembering the misfortune threatened to the servant who hid his God-given talent in the earth. I am bound to pass on the holy account that has reached me. And let no one think, this is what I want you to pay attention to, and let no one think, continues St. Sophronius, that I have had the audacity to write untruth or doubt this great marvel. May I never lie about holy things. If there do happen to be people who after reading this account, or as we could say, these accounts, if there do happen to be people who, after reading these accounts, do not believe them, may the Lord have mercy on them, because reflecting on the weakness of human nature, they consider impossible these wonderful things accomplished by holy people. But now we must begin to tell this most amazing story which has taken place in our generation. I place that here before us, not because St. Sophronius is writing about the Twelve Apostles, because... As I said earlier, there is a certain, certain type of person today who doubts that miracles can take place. In fact, they doubt very sadly, they doubt uh, that someone can live the life of holiness, especially in the face of an attack, a physical attack especially. We are going to read and learn about the lives of the twelve apostles, great and holy men that went before us, that walked the way of Christ before us, many of who died for their belief in Jesus Christ, many of whom healed people of their illnesses and even raised people from the dead. It happened, and it still can happen. As our Lord says, a man who has enough faith can even move mountains. Do we believe the words of our Lord or are we part of that generation of unbelief? I hope, I hope that we can trust in those holy things that have come before us. I want to begin with maybe a general, um, a general introduction to who the apostles were. Why we're even interested in them. Certainly there are probably a few uh, Protestants in our, in our midst. Maybe some watching online. Why wouldn't we just read the Gospels? Why be interested? Why have the bones of dead people back in the back of the room? Why? We have to be able to answer these questions as Catholics and to answer them in a way that is convincing. Not because we simply want to convince people and win the argument, but because we want to bring people to the truth. And we believe as Catholics, and I'm not ashamed to say it, there is one way to salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ established on this earth one way to Him, and that is through the Holy Church. And the Holy Church was founded 
by none other than the men we're going to be looking at over the next three weeks. We have a great gift then, I think, before us to behold the great mysteries and wonders, as St. Sophronius has, has said, which have taken place in our time. Who were the ap- holy apostles? What do we mean by the word apostle, friends? What does it mean? Tell me. Sent, sent yeah. One who is sent. A messenger. One who has received a message is now taking it to others. Literally, an apostle is one who is sent. They were a core group. The ones who were closest to Jesus. We want to distinguish for ourselves three levels of apostleship. It's important to keep in mind as we're trying to get hold of who these guys were. First of all, first of all, that first level of apostleship. By the way, if you have a notebook with you, I would encourage you to be taking some notes as we go through. I'm going to try to present this program over the next three weeks in a way that is maybe more like a classroom than a lecture hall. Three levels of apostles. First of all, the 70. We hear about the 70 apostles, that larger group that gathered and followed our Lord. A lot of times we talk about the 70 disciples, those who learned from the Lord. But in fact, we know that the 70 were also sent out. You remember the story in the Gospels that means sent out on mission. And so certainly the 70 can be considered apostles. Among those 70, the tradition tells us St. Hippolytus actually identifies some of those 70, one of which is Jude Thaddeus, who ends up becoming one of the 12 apostles. Okay? Matthias. Who was Matthias? You remember? Yeah, it took Judas. Judas who, though? Judas Iscariot. We need to make a distinction because there's two Judases in the list of the apostles. Okay? Uh, Ananias. Stephen. You remember Stephen, one of the early deacons and first martyr of the church. I shouldn't say first martyr, technically. We'll get to that. Even Linus, who ends up becoming the Pope of Rome. Linus, one of the 70 apostles by tradition. And then, of course, out of those 70, our Lord draws a closer group of friends, the 12 apostles, who we all know very well. And then, out of that 12, His closest friends... The close three, Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. And we'll take a look at, at, at those, the lives of those apostles even more clearly, beginning with James tonight. We need to make a distinction between what a disciple is and what an apostle is. Disciple, the, the, the word literally means a learner, one who's learning. Okay, Whereas an apostle is one who is sent. So we need to understand that one can be a disciple without being an apostle. You can be a learner and yet not be called upon to be sent out yet. Why would you not be called to be sent out yet? Yeah, you don't know enough yet. You don't know enough. And I bet you a lot of us in this room, including me, feel like we're not quite ready to be apostles yet. And that's why we're here, to become disciples first. You can't give what you don't have. You must be a learner before you can be sent out. Take a look. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. We're going to be looking a lot at the Scriptures tonight and hopefully over the next three weeks. Luke chapter 10. This is the sending of the 70, but of course we can learn much about what our Lord expects of those that He sends out as apostles, and I think even for ourselves and certainly for the twelve. Chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them out ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to come. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals. And salute no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace shall rest upon him. But if not, it shall return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. It's a fundamental 
aspect, a root, the seed of the apostolic preaching. It's not complicated, friends. The kingdom of God is here and present. The question is, for us, do we know what the kingdom of God is? But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. And I tell you, it shall be more tolerable on that day for Sodom than for that town. He goes on to condemn Chorazin and Bethsaida. Bethsaida was one of the towns which the, a number of the apostles came from. And there's probably good reason why they rejected Jesus and the apostles. Because a prophet is never accepted in his own hometown. Okay, So he condemns Bethsaida and Chorazin. Bethsaida and Chorazin, by the way, are right there on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. Why are we interested in these guys? First of all, for us here in this room, we are in the midst of our Lenten journey. And the apostles set before us a model of how to journey with the Lord. What it means to leave the comfort of our home, to set aside the comfort of the comfort of our home, the comfort of the things that we become used to. Lent is seriously is for that purpose. The church says, don't eat certain foods during Lent, or set aside those things during Lent, not because those things are bad in themselves, but because we become so used to just going to them. We become hungry, we eat. We're thirsty, we drink. We want entertainment or we're bored, and we get our entertainment. And the church says, wait a minute. Stop just letting your lower passions determine where you're going in this life. Because I have a plan to carry you to a place where you would not otherwise go. That's what Jesus said to Peter. Prophesying that Peter would be taken to martyrdom. Peter said, I could do it myself, Lord. I will never deny you. I can do it myself. And he proved that he could not. Only by the grace of God he could leave those things behind. And we're going to see 12 men, great men, who left everything behind. They didn't simply turn off their radio and stop eating Hershey Hershey Kisses for 40 days. These men set aside and said, I am done with that former life. Lent is not just for 40 days, my friend. It's to set aside those things which are distracting us from our walk with God. That when we come to the resurrection... We can enter into the death, the passion, the death and resurrection of our Lord and then live with Him no longer in our former ways. To live with Him now the life of the resurrection and to do what He wants in our life. And we now know what He wants because we have spent 40 days fasting so that we can hear His voice more clearly. So we place these 12 apostles before us now during our time of our Lenten journey as an inspiration, as a guide to us. They have gone the way before us and they know where we need to go. But there's more. St. John Chrysostom says beautifully, I wish that it were possible to meet with one who could deliver to us the history of the apostles. Not only all they wrote and spoke of, but of the rest of their life also, even what they ate, when they walked, and where they sat, what they did every day, in what parts they were, where they lodged, to relate everything with minute detail. St. John Chrysostom and the early fathers had a great desire to touch, to listen to, to see the apostles. Eusebius, writing of St. Clement, St. Clement of Rome, says that he had seen the, apost- the blessed apostles, that St. Clement had conversed with them, and still he had their preaching ringing in his ears and their authentic tradition before his eyes. Eusebius wants to know Clement because Clement knew the apostles. He wanted to see Clement Read Clement, know Clement, love Clement, because Clement had become a disciple 
of the disciples of the Lord. Irenaeus also tells us that as a student, St. Polycarp, we've read and learned about St. Polycarp at the Institute. St. Polycarp was taught by the apostles themselves and had familiar intercourse with many that had seen Christ. He spoke with them. He lived with them. He sat down with them. If we could only see and learn from Polycarp, we could hear the words of the Apostle John from whom he learned. An amazing thing. Open to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. St. Paul writing to the Corinthians. I do not write this to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Now leave your Bibles there. We're going to come back to that text. I urge you, Corinthians, become imitators of me. Why didn't St. Paul say become imitators of Christ? Say it out, Ginger. Go ahead. They didn't know Christ. They knew Paul. They knew Paul. And? What do you say? They didn't know Christ. Couldn't they have read the Gospels? Huh? Actually, they could not have because they didn't have them yet. Right? Very interesting. This idea of sola scriptura doesn't apply. That Scripture and Scripture alone is our sole authority does not apply to the early Christians. Okay? But Ginger says something very important. What did you say, Ginger, exactly? Yes. Oh, she just took a bite. <laughs> she says, they didn't have Jesus standing before them. I say, Ginger, wait a minute. Jesus promises, I will remain with you always. Is Jesus a liar, Ginger? No, of course not. He sent the Spirit down to them, and he's with them. How is he with them, Ginger? How is he with them? Andrew. In his priests and bishops, certainly, Andrew. But you know, Andrew, the problem with you is you don't understand that Jesus loves you, Andrew. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? Andrew, are you a priest? Are you a bishop? And yet, Andrew, when you were baptized, St. Paul says that you were baptized into Christ and you became a... Christian, you became a little Christ. St. Paul can say, imitate me, not because he's an apostle. Yes, certainly he's an apostle. But more fundamentally, St. Paul is a Christian. He has been baptized into Christ. And now, because of his baptism into the Lord, he is, as St. Paul says, the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. He is the mouthpiece of Christ on earth. Jesus says, I will remain with you always. How is he to remain with us always? He is to remain with us always in the body of Christ, which which is the church. And the church is made up of its members, hands and feet, eyes and toes, fingernails. Andrew? I don't remember what I asked you. What was my question? (laughs) What's that? Yeah, how is Christ among us? Yes, certainly He is here among us in a very special way in our priests and bishops. Forget the deacons, by the way. Andrew forgot about the deacons, but I won't hold that against him. But He is here present among us also in each and every member of the body of Christ. And this is fundamentally important to understanding why we are reading about the apostles. Because those who meet Christians meet Christ Himself. Period. Be imitators of me, Corinthians. Be imitators of me because I have been transformed into Christ Jesus. It is no longer I who live, St. Paul says, but it is Christ who lives in me. I have set aside the former life. I have left those ways. And now my one, my sole object in this world is to do the will of God so that those that speak with me will hear the words of God. Those who watch me will see one who is walking in the ways of the Lord. They will look at me and they, say, they will say, there is a Christian. 
The apostles were the first ones that received that gift of the Holy Spirit. The first ones to go out as Christians among the wolves. St. Clement of Rome, again, says the apostles received the gospel for us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ was sent from God. Thus Christ is from God and the apostles from Christ. In both cases, the process was orderly and derived from the will of God. The apostles received their instruction. They were filled with conviction through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and with faith by the Word of God. And they went out full of conviction in the Holy Spirit, preaching the Gospel that the Kingdom of God was about to come. Look back at 1 Corinthians 4.16 with me. Notice that he goes on now. From verse 16, I urge you then be imitators of me. Therefore, and what's going on here? St. Paul can't come to the Corinthians. So he writes him a letter. He writes him a letter. And he says, I want to come and visit you. But in the meantime, I'm sending Timothy, my disciple, to you. Timothy was a disciple of St. Paul. And notice what he says. Therefore I sent to you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Does St. Paul have any doubt at all that Timothy is going to teach exactly what St. Paul taught? Absolutely not. He is 100% confident that his disciple, who has become a learner, a disciple, is now ready to become an apostle. And there is absolutely no doubt that when he goes out into the world, he is going to do nothing other than what he learned. As St. Paul did nothing other than what he learned. And St. Peter did nothing other than what he learned. So that those that meet the apostles will hear the words of Jesus Christ ringing in their ears, coming forth from the mouth of the holy apostles. Take a look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I've read you this text many times because it is, is, is so important, so important for those that would believe erroneously that suddenly, once Jesus ascended into, the, into heaven, once John died, that all of a sudden, the church lost its way. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. This is St. Paul writing to his disciple Timothy, who we just learned about in Corinthians. You then, my son, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me before many witnesses... And trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now listen to that. You then, my son. Now, who has St. Paul learned from? He learned from Jesus. He had, Christ appeared to him. Christ appeared to him. And he says he was taken up almost as like into the third heaven. And as I've said to you before, what does he not see who sees him who sees God? What does he not see who sees Him, who sees God. Because when you look into the eyes of God, what God sees is revealed to you. This is why St. Paul can write so beautifully about the mystery of the church. St. Paul, the first generation. St. Timothy, the second generation now. The apostles handing on the faith to the next generation. But notice what he says. And what you have heard from me before many witnesses... And trust to faithful men, third generation, who will also be able to teach others, fourth generation. You have a concern among the apostles, and this is one of the missions of the apostles. I would say the, the mission of the apostles was twofold, although we could probably say three or four other things. But I'd like to focus on two aspects of their mission. And one was to guard the truth against heresy, against error. And they took that job seriously. And you say, well, how do you know that, Deacon Savage? I'll tell you why. Because they left their homes, their families, and they died for it. You don't die for something that you're not serious about. They believed what they had received. And it became their life mission to hand it on 
faithfully. It was their mission to hand that truth on. That truth which they had witnessed, which we hear St. Paul talk about to St. Timothy. What had they witnessed? What was it that they had seen that was so fundamentally important that they had to leave their homes and go out into the world? What was it that we write libraries and offer degrees about? That here men who had little learning were able to go out and proclaim and convert the world. Turn with me very quickly to Acts chapter 1. Actually, it's chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. You know the story well. The story of Pentecost. Come down with me then to verse 14. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. And of course, the first attack they make is, these guys are, these guys are drunk. Okay? He goes back, he quotes Joel, because the prophet Joel says that when the Messiah comes, there will be a new wine which is poured out in Jerusalem. So he quotes Joel to remind these people of what the prophets had said would happen and was being fulfilled in their midst. Okay? But as soon as he defends who, what, what they're doing and that they're not drunk, in verse 22, he turns to them and says, Men of Israel, hear these words. And this is what this is the, the kernel, the seed of the apostolic preaching. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the divine plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified, you killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up. Period. The center, the heart of the apostolic preaching was the mystery of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Period. There was a man who rose from the dead and solved the greatest crisis which men face upon this earth. That we will all someday face death. There is a man who has solved that problem. The heart of the apostolic preaching. They were witnesses to that authentic teaching of Jesus Christ. As we see, if you want to turn very quickly to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, to the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. The final words which Jesus gives to His apostles in chapter 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This was the mission of the apostles. To hand on, without addition, without compromise, the authentic teaching of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, to hand on the news of the resurrection. They were to be shepherds and guardians of the flock of God. Who was the first, who was the first apostle? Who was the first one sent by God? John. John, who? John the Baptist. Ah, John, nice. Yeah, you went to the Holy Land with me. Uh Turn to the Gospel of John chapter 1 very quickly. I heard Andrew out there. I also think I heard Peter come out over there. Look at John. The Gospel of John chapter 1. Verse 6. Chapter 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God. One who is sent is an, is an apostle. There was one sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness. What's the word witness? It's another word for the word witness. Back to the Greek. A martyr. An apostle is one who has been sent because he is a witness. He is a martyr already. And now, that martyrdom oftentimes comes in the flesh. 
because we call him a, we call him a martyr because what we see him do in the flesh, setting aside his own life for the life of God, has already been done because he has seen something so powerful, so moving that he knows his former life is worth absolutely nothing in comparison to it. He leaves everything behind because he has witnessed the one truth which is life changing. That God loves us and He wants to share His life with us. And when we share the life of God, we receive the gift of immortality. Because God's life knows no end. And those who have God's life in them can never die. We will live with God forever. That is the central mystery of our faith. Everything else is in addition to it. If you want to know what to talk with people about when you want to share the faith with them, talk to them about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything else will take its place. Mary, Peter, confession, all of the other aspects of the faith will fall into place if we can simply preach the mystery of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That He loves us and He wants to share His life with us. That is why He came, period. They went forth then, with the ringing in their ears of the words of God. I want to go through very quickly a little practical exercise with you um, to list off the apostles, because I bet there's some in this room which might have a hard time listing them. So I want to make sure we get it up here on the board, right here at the the start. But I want to read you a quotation from a book I was reading um, by uh, Bernard Ruffin. It's put out by our Sunday visitor. Very nice. Uh, the Twelve, The Lives of the Apostles, After Calvary. Hey, I found, it on, I found it on the internet. I said, look, that's my topic. So I bought it. And he says this, Simply identifying all of the Twelve Apostles in a, is a minor dilemma. One problem in identifying them precisely is the fact that the first century Jews seem to have, had, seem to have had comparatively few given names. In the New Testament alone, There are 11 different men named Simon, 6 named Jude, 9 named John, there are 6 Jameses, 5 Josephs, 7 Marys, 2 Philips, and even 2 other men named Jesus beside the Son of God. Okay? So if you're confused, don't worry, I am too. (laughs) Further, there are other men that we know very well that we might call apostles, we might even think of as members of the Twelve, even though technically they were not. St. Paul. Or Barnabas. These were men that were close to our Lord and close to the apostles, but don't technically fit into our Twelve. We also need to keep in mind that two of the evangelists that wrote the Gospels were not Apostles. Who were they? Luke and and Mark. Luke and Mark were not apostles. So, what were their names? What were their names? If you're taking notes, write down these references, and we'll have a chance to look at them over time. We'll look at them right now. But Matthew chapter 10, verse 2 and following. Mark chapter 3, verse 14 and following. You got that? Okay, Mark chapter 3, verse 14 and following. And Luke chapter 6, verse 13 and following. Those are the three times when the twelve apostles are listed. John does not list them, at least in that way, as a, as a list like the others do. Okay? We're not going to try to give all of the relations of all the apostles at this moment, but I want to try at least to list them for you. So... Uh, first of all, who's your first apostle that you're going to tell me? Peter. Yeah, Peter. So, but, well, give me his whole name now. We gotta, I want you to remember his whole name because as we go, it's going to get confusing. Okay? So Simon. Well, we've got to tell Simon Peter. Bar. Jonah. What does that mean? Son of Jonah. Exactly. And his brother? Andrew. We should really call him Andrew. Barjona, exactly. All right, who else? Who else? What are the other two two brothers you know really well? That's right, John and James. Okay, John and James, sons of Zebedee, Zebedee, and 
Who was their mother? Tradition tells us Salome. And we'll take a look at that uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Gospels, okay? Or Salome. How do you pronounce Salome? Salome, I guess, okay? Um, who else? Who else? How about Matthew? Also called? Yeah, Matthew. I'm sorry, my handwriting is horrible. Also called Levi. It's not unusual to have two names or even three names at the time, okay? And by tradition, his brother, James. Whoa, wait a minute. We got two James, so we better identify who this other James is. This is James the... The greater. Why they called him the greater is not exactly clear. Okay? The greater, the bigger. He could have been a bigger guy. The older, possible. Okay? And James, the? The lesser. Poor guy. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and mark these like this because here we have, we have brothers, families. It's very important to understand this. Jesus was calling together his best friends. His best friends. He wasn't randomly picking people out of the crowd. Okay? He knew these guys. So you have brothers. You have families. Okay? Who else? What about Jude? Jude has a second name in the Gospels. Thaddeus. Jude Thaddeus. And his brother? Simon. Also known as Simon the Zealot. Simon, the brother of Jude. Now, we have to say something because these were, by tradition, we know these to be brothers. There's also some indication in the scriptures that they were brothers. They also had a third brother, also a James. James the righteous, or the just. James the just is probably the best known of the Jameses, at least the best known of what he did. But he's not one of the twelve apostles, so we're not going to be looking at his life too much. I will tell you what he did, though. We can also group together two more guys, not because they're brothers, but because they were friends before meeting Jesus. And who were they? Philip and Bartholomew. And what's Bartholomew's other name? Do you know? Nathaniel. And we'll look at it, uh, have a chance to look at why we call him Bartholome. Bartholome. Oh, what's Bartholome mean? Son of Ptolemy. Bartholomew. Okay? So, Nathaniel Bartholome. Uh huh. You learned something. Yeah, one person learned one thing today. That's great. Okay. All right. And who else? Thomas. Yeah, and? Matthias. Matthias. Thank you very much. Some people, their name is scratched from the book of life. And so we don't speak about them too much. So we have Thomas and we have Matthias. When did Matthias come into the scene? In Acts chapter 1. Okay, we just looked at Acts chapter 1. You'll be able to have a chance to go and look at that later. But we're not probably going to get into Matthias because I'm simply not going to have enough time. So I'm going to cheat and not deal with Matthias in our, in our time together. But I will mention all the others. If I have time at the end, I will say something. Now, I said that, uh, that James and John, sons of? Sons of thunder or sons of? Zebedee. Zebedee's wife, Salome. There is a tradition. There is a tradition. I'm not saying it is absolutely, obviously it's not big T tradition. None of what we're going to be talking about is that in this. Okay, but there is a tradition that Salome, put on your seatbelts, friends, was the daughter of none other than Joseph, the betrothed of Mary. Well, how is that possible? The more ancient tradition of the church, and I say more ancient tradition because it is much more ancient, going back to the earliest days of the church, there was a belief that Joseph was not a young, strapping man who made some heroic act of virtue to be betrothed to the mother of God, but that he was a just and righteous older man who was a widower. And he had sons and daughters prior to being betrothed to Mary. As an old man, he was given to Mary to protect her, knowing knowing that he would never compromise his relationship with her because he was an older man and he was also just and righteous, okay? So, Salome 
would have been, by this tradition, the daughter of Joseph making John and James Jesus' half-brothers. Okay? Right. Brothers. No, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Half-brothers. I'm sorry. Nephews. 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 Okay? And that Jude and Simon, that Jude, Thaddeus, and Simon were brothers of Salome and also sons of Joseph, which makes James the just also a son of Joseph and a half-brother of Jesus. They are mentioned in the Gospels as brothers of the Lord. Now we always say, yes, but that means cousins. That means cousins because we're trying to defend that Mary was ever a virgin. But the fact is, the most ancient tradition of the church is that Joseph had sons and that James and Jude and Simon were three of those sons along with Salome, his daughter. Okay, again, you don't have to believe that. But that is one of the traditions going back to the earliest days of the church. Okay, you have a map in front of you. One of the traditions which was handed on and, and, and written down by Eusebius the historian. Now Eusebius lived or died around 340. So he was, a, he was a third century historian of the church and wrote down a lot. We're indebted to Eusebius for quite a bit. And he tells us that on the day of Pentecost, or just after the day of Pentecost, that the apostles came together and discussed the fact that the Lord had told them that they were to go out into the world. They then drew lots, each one of them drawing the place in the world which they were to be sent. And along with drawing lots, on the Feast of Pentecost, when they were given the gift of tongues, that each one of them was given a particular language by which he was able then to go out into these new areas and preach to them seems to make sense to me. So you have your map before you. I want to talk about that map. Find Jerusalem and make a star there for yourself. Good. Now, so I want you to draw a line from Jerusalem. I want you to come across the Mediterranean Sea to Rome. Draw a line from Jerusalem up to Rome. Who went to Rome? Peter. Peter. So along that line, you can write in Peter. Very good. From Jerusalem, I want you to come kind of just below that line you drew for Peter, and I want you to come all the way over to Spain. Great. Who went to Spain? James the, James the, the Greater went to Spain. Exactly. Coming down then from Jerusalem into Egypt, down here, Mark. So draw a line from Jerusalem down into Egypt. Okay, Mark. Okay. From Jerusalem... Down into Arabia, yep. James, the lesser. James, the lesser. Okay. Coming from Jerusalem all the way over across the Arabian Sea that you have to the edge of your map, that's India. Who went to India? Thomas, Thomas, exactly. Okay. Coming just west from Jerusalem and just south barely, but just south, right over in that area on your map. So Jerusalem, just south, you're going to hit the tip of the Arabian Sea. It's probably got its own name there, but I don't know what it is. Matthew. Okay, coming from Jerusalem, we're going to head exactly west and into Persia. Okay, that's going to head west, just, sorry, east, thank you, thank you. West all the way past that tip of the Arabian Sea and into Persia and eventually into Iran, we'll talk about him, Simon, okay? Simon the Zealot, exactly, okay? Coming just north of where Simon went, so you can just kind of arch over the top of him, and, and still going into Persia, Bartholomew, Nathaniel, right? Nathaniel Bartholomew, okay? Coming up north then, in between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, you see that piece of land that comes through there? It kind of does a little zigzag. That's Armenia, that area up in there. That's Armenia, okay? Jude. Jude went up to Armenia, okay? Andrew is a little more difficult to say, but for argument's sake, we'll just say he went a little bit just north like, like Jude went, but just west of him, just to get his line off, okay? And up toward the Black Sea, but just on the, on the eastern side of the Black Sea, okay? Andrew came right up that area. 
right basically on that line you're drawing up, south of the Black Sea, you might want to make a, a little star, just barely south of the Black Sea, is the city of Edessa. And we're going to talk about the city of Edessa. Where Andrew went. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that too much. And then finally, coming up straight and hitting up into the Black Sea is the Apostle Philip. Okay? And then... Okay, so Philip kind of coming up more towards almost like just up here more towards Constantinople, although we're believed that Andrew also went there. Coming over here to Ephesus was John. John the Beloved, right? Exactly. Okay, we need to speak about James the Greater, brother of John. James the Greater, the brother of John. And we'll just look right now in the, in the Gospels. Take a look at Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. We're speaking of James the Greater, brother of John. It is believed that James was the first apostle to be martyred. And that's why we're going to look at him first. Mark chapter 15, verse 40. There were also women looking on from afar. This is obviously at the crucifixion. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. And Salome. Okay? We can look then, hold your hand and right there, and look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, verse 56. Or verse 55, maybe. Yeah. Verse 55, there were also many women were looking on from afar who had, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, or Joseph, and the, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, if you looked over at Mark, what did it say her name was? Salome, exactly. So now we know that Salome is the mother of the sons of Zebedee. We also know that the sons of Zebedee, we don't want to look at the text right now, are... James and John. James and John. So now we know that she is also, she's the mother of James and John. Okay? As I said, Salome, by tradition, was the daughter of Joseph the betrothed. Okay? In Matthew chapter 4, we get the calling of James. And we don't have to look at it, but you can write this down. Chapter 4, verse 21. He was fishing. You know the story? He was fishing with his brother and his father. So we know James the Great was a fisherman. Okay? In Matthew chapter 20, verse, verse 20 through 23. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, who's that? Salome, came up to Jesus with her sons and kneeling before him, she asked him, asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she says, command that my two sons of mine may sit, one at your right and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said, We are able. And he said to them, You will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand at my left is not mine to grant. Okay? So Jesus prophesies the sufferings of the sons of Zebedee. Okay? They are called sons of thunder because in Luke chapter 9, you can turn there, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 9. Another one of those Bible verses I just love. Luke 9.51. The first ecumenical meeting of the apostles. 9.51. When the days drew near for him to be received up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But the people would not receive him because he had set his face toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to bid fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. You've got to love it. You've got to love it. Wouldn't go over well today, I don't think, but there it is. Okay? And of course, James and John were both present at the transfiguration, being part of his closest friends. Acts chapter 12. Go ahead and turn there with me. Acts chapter 12. Verse 1, about that time, Herod, this is Herod Agrippa, Herod the king laid a vi violent hands upon some who belonged to the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. 
Okay, so, the, so by Scripture, he was probably beheaded. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. Now, you have before you the text, uh, one of the traditional texts that comes down to us called the Passion of James. It is believed that James was martyred in Jerusalem after having gone forth from Jerusalem all the way to the Iberian Peninsula and I mean, preached the resurrection there. It is believed that he returned back to Jerusalem. For what reason, we do not know. However, two reasons we know he would have returned back to Jerusalem were the first council in Acts chapter 15 and also... When else would he have returned to Jerusalem? When the mother of God reposed in the Lord and was assumed into heaven, all the apostles were gathered there together. There are two reasons he would have returned back to Jerusalem. But when he came back to Jerusalem, we have the story here of what happened. And we're going to go ahead and read through this very quickly. The holy apostle James traveled through Spain and other countries, preaching the word of God. Afterwards, he returned again to Jerusalem and was as threatening to the Jews as thunder. For he courageously and boldly preached Jesus Christ, proclaiming him the true Messiah, the Savior of the world. And the Jews, unable to withstand him, hired a certain sorcerer named Hermogenes to engage him in debate and put him to shame. But the magus, the magician, a prideful man, did not wish to converse with James and instead sent his disciple, Philetus, by name, uh, saying, not only myself, but even my disciple, will James be unable to best in disputation. Philetus came and conversed with the holy apostle James, uh, but being in no position to oppose the wisdom of the Holy Spirit with which the apostle was filled, he fell as silent as one mute. Recognizing the truth, Philetus was humbled and returned to his master, the magician, and he informed him that nothing could overcome James, who even confirmed his words with miracles. Moreover, Philetus advised his teacher to abandon his lore of sorcery and become the disciple of James. But the prideful Hermogenes summoned up de- demons by his spells and commanded them to hold Philetus in a certain place in bonds so that he would not be able to come from the spot. And he added, let us see how thy James will deliver thee now. On learning this, the apostle sent his towel. You remember the story in Acts of the Apostles, don't you? When, they, when, the, when the sick asked for, for uh, napkins or cloths to be touched to the apostles and brought to the sick so they could be healed. Okay? On learning that he sent his towel, telling him to take hold of the towel and say the following words, The Lord looseth the fettered, and the Lord setteth the right the fallen. And no sooner had he uttered these words, than immediately he was freed from the invisible bonds. For the demons, terrified by the apostle's towel and the power of the word spoken, loosed their hold on Philetus and fled from him. Then he went to the holy James, and he was baptized. But Hermogenes, filled with great rage and anger, conjured up the demons who ministered to him, and adjured them to, to bring him James and Philetus bound. But when the demons drew nigh, the angel of the Lord laid hold of those demons and began to torment them. The demons, tortured by the power of God, cried out for all to hear, James, apostle of Christ, be merciful to us, for we came to bind thee and Philetus on, on the orders of Hermogenes. And behold, we are, uh, now we ourselves are bound fast and suffer cruelly. The holy James then said to the demons, Let the angel of God who hath bound you release you from the bonds, and go ye and bring hither to me Hermogenes, doing him no harm. And straightway the demons loosed from their bonds and betook themselves to Hermogenes and seized him and set him bound before the apostles in the twinkling of an eye and asked the apostles to permit them to avenge their grievances on the wretch. Then said the apostle to Philetus, Our Lord hath commanded us to render good for evil, for which cause release thou Hermogenes and deliver him from the demons. Recognizing the power of Christ and seeing the impotence of the demons, Hermogenes gathered together all his books of sorcery, brought them to the holy James, and falling on his feet, cried out, True servant of the true God, who deliverest the souls of men from perdition, have mercy upon me and accept thine enemy as thy disciple. Having learned the holy faith from James, Hermogenes received baptism, burned his books of sorcery on the apostles' orders, and became a true servant of Christ. 
The Jews, seeing all that had taken place, were exceedingly wroth and persuaded King Herod Agrippa to initiate a persecution against the church of Christ. He put James to death. And then Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also, and he put him in prison. Okay, that is the, the end of the story as we receive it. And I will tell you how it is that we end up, not now, because we're out of time, I know some of you have to go home, but f- during question and answer. If you would like, I'd be happy to speak. How is it that then James' body gets back to Spain and becomes the third, actually at one point ranked in front of Rome as the most frequented pilgrimage site in Christendom? Okay? And still today, thousands upon thousands flock to Santiago de Compostela in Spain to visit the Holy Apostle James. I've been there myself. It is a beautiful pilgrimage. Uh, But I'll have a chance maybe just to tell you a little bit about that during question and answer if you want. All right, thank you very much for your attention. God bless you. Uh, All right, question and answer. Uh, It seems like I keep going back to this with various lectures, but if Salome was Joseph's uh, daughter. Oh, no, she's going to ask me a genealogy question. No, no, uh, I'm just I'm not saying. a Mormon, by the way. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the Mormons are on the genealogy. Go ahead. All right. Wouldn't, wouldn't it have been kind of an insult for Jesus to place Mary in John's yeah. care rather than Jude or Simon? Right, right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's possible. It's possible, and I know you, we've talked about this before, and I'm not sure I have a good answer to that, but I do want to make sure that as we go through these things together, I want to share with you guys the, all of the things which come down to us, and that is certainly one of the traditions which comes down to us. Now, what the early Christians would have said about that that held this tradition, I can't tell you that. Uh, but I will tell you that the dating of the tradition that Joseph was an older man and had sons uh, certainly predates the tradition which... That he, that he was a younger man and didn't have sons and, and was not a widower. Now, I'm not saying you have to hold one or the other. The church doesn't say that. But I do give you, it does give you a sense as I, as I study this. And very much I want you to know that as we're studying through these things, guys, these are things I'm studying with you now. Because as I, as I started to prepare myself for this lecture, I wouldn't say I was highly equipped to teach you about the Twelve Apostles. But I'm doing the research for you and sharing with you what I'm learning. But isn't it interesting that so many of his closest friends were, I mean, look, his 12 apostles were his friends, right? They were his brothers and and his uh, close relatives, and also that they were friends with each other. Where was Matthew when he was called? Do you remember? Remember where he was? He was a tax collector. Where was he collecting taxes? Do you remember? No, thank you, in Capernaum, and in Capernaum. And so there was Matthew in Capernaum, which indicates, we don't know where Matthew and James uh, were, were from necessarily, but certainly there's, you could, there's a chance that they were from Capernaum, and there's also a chance that James was with his brother Matthew in Capernaum, if possible, okay? Um, and so you have all of a sudden this drawing together of these guys that are not... I think sometimes we have the sense that Jesus walked around, he was just like, all of a sudden he appears and they see a guy, they're like, come with me. And they're like, okay. But no, they had, they had walked with him, they had heard from him. In fact, many of them were disciples of John the Baptist beforehand. Right? Who was one of the ones that was, a, was yeah, Andrew, and then he went and got his brother Peter, which, what do you think? Do you think Peter would have known John the Baptist? Yeah, his brother's there with him. And it's very possible because it seems as though, as you read through the Gospels, that they weren't staying, some of them at least, were not staying with John the Baptist all the time. They were with him and then they went back and fished with their dad. And then they came back to John the Baptist for some more time with him. And so, uh, what was my point about that? I, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> my mind, I'm losing my mind. No, but then it's very possible that, that Peter... Just because he wasn't with, with Andrew at that moment doesn't mean he wasn't a disciple of John the Baptist, right? Um, same with, with Philip and Nathaniel. It says Philip went and got his friend Nathaniel, went and got Nathaniel. 
And uh, so it's possible, it's possible that Nathaniel also was a disciple of John the Baptist. And uh, it's just fascinating because these were his, his friends and his family, right? The ones he was closest to. And all of a sudden it becomes a very beautiful thing to learn about the apostles because you're learning about the family of God. Okay? Um, what was um, John the Baptist's relation again to, to the Jesus? To Jesus? Yeah. It would have been his cousin, right? How was, how was Elizabeth. It, how was because of Elizabeth was the, was the, how does that go? Elizabeth was the cousin of Mary, right? So it would have been second cousins or whatever you want to call the thing. Whatever. They didn't worry about those things in those days. Look, they were brothers. They were, bro- they were part of the same family. It wasn't like they were living long ways away from each other. So one night they're sleeping in one home. Next night, this is why Jesus gets lost, by the way, when they were traveling, okay, to the temple. And then they come back and say, like, three days later, like, where is he? And it was, he was lost. Why was he lost? Because that was their normal life. That for two or three days, one mom's nursing one kid and another mom's nursing the other, or they're off going this way and that way. It was the way they lived in a village together. And, and uh, so. Yes, uh, Deacon Sabatino, in uh, Matthew's Gospel, our Lord tells uh, uh, James and John that they, are, they will be drinking his cup, mm. uh, indicating that they will be martyred. But. Was John martyred? But, John, but John, John died of, an, of old age. Right. In fact, yeah. And in fact, by the way, I'll, and I'll share this with you as we go through, there are traditions that other apostles possibly didn't die of martyrdom and died of old age. I know we always think it's only John, but there are other traditions that say that some of the other guys did die of old age. But certainly, we know that a martyr is a witness, right? And a witness is one who has seen to the extent of a witness in this sense is one who has seen to the extent that they, they die to them old, their, old, their old self. And so certainly all of the apostles are martyrs in that sense, but certainly John undergoes martyrdom. By the tradition of the church, he undergoes martyrdom when he is boiled alive in oil. But when they took him out, he was still alive. And the, and the, the, the rulers became so afraid of what had happened that they didn't dare try to kill him. They just exiled him off into Patmos. Okay? So, anyways, I would say, you know, we call St. Sebastian a double martyr, right? He was killed, and then he didn't die. They shot him full of arrows, right? He didn't die. They thought he died. He was left for dead. And then they come and they pick him up, nurse him back to hell. The first thing he does, he goes right back and goes preaching Jesus again. They kill him again. So he's a double martyr, okay? Uh, so, so, John, so John was certainly a martyr. Certainly a martyr. Yeah. There are more than one double martyr. By the way, we're going to read about one of the double martyrs. Uh, it's a Bartholomew, I think. Bartholomew is a double martyr. He was crucified, and then, uh, then they, they got scared and took him down. And then he converted everybody, and then he went and got martyred again. So. Um, how did James's body get back to Spain? Oh, thank you, Chris. That's very kind of you. That's very... So, okay, the, the, uh, the, the tradition tells us that when James was beheaded... Um, that, uh, that his body was left out of disregard. They refused even to give him burial. He just left his body. And of course, his closest friends, his disciples, came knowing that these were the precious relics of a saint. They took up his body, and the tradition tells us they took it off in, at nighttime, okay, all the way out to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and boarded a boat with it, not knowing what they were going to do next. Okay, because look, just like the apostles saw Jesus crucified, they were scared. They were scared. And these guys watched their master now get, get beheaded. And they said, this is bad business. Like, hey, we're going we're to die. So they got out of town. They got out of Jerusalem. They headed out to the coast, boarded a boat. And the tradition tells us that a wind picked up by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And this is where, and I meant to say this earlier. I meant to say this earlier. This, I had a great one-liner from a book I was reading speaking about some of these Traditions and whether they're true or not true. And he describes them as, some of them, as fictional accounts based upon real events. And I liked that. Fictional accounts based upon real events. As every aspect of the, of the, of the argument between James and Hermogenes accurate, well, there wasn't a guy probably sitting there, you know, <laughs> writing it all down. So how do we receive these things? How are we to receive them today? What value are they to us? Certainly there's historical basis for these things. But certainly, as a friend and as a follower, you're going to want to 
you know, tell the story and tell it beautifully and even more beautifully, right? When you see someone great or you remember how your grandmother made pasta, this for me anyways, okay, she made pasta and I, for my kids, I embellish the stories. I want to make it as most, most awesome as I can, right? And that's exactly what took place in these stories, that certainly there is some, there is some embellishment, but does it mean that they're not helpful to us and tell us some historical truth? And they, they do. So anyways, the story goes that the angels took James's body on that boat and swept it in a great wind off the shore by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Well, who are the angels? Who are the angels in the church? The angels in the church are... are we, we are the angels in the church. Don't we stand and say, holy, holy, holy during the liturgy? Huh? Doesn't the deacon stand at the altar as an angel of God in the Byzantine tradition with a, with a, with a fan, with the angel's wings flapping over the holy gifts? Okay? The deacon stands an angel. Who were the angels? They were his friends who had been sent from God to take his body now to safety. And so the, the tradition is that the wind picked up, carried the boat across the Mediterranean Sea, through the straits, off the map, Right there, the Straits of Gibraltar. They came up the west coast of what country? Or what? Yeah, Spain. Exactly. The Iberian Peninsula came up the west coast of the Iberian Peninsula and there came close to the land. Now, what is the symbol of the Apostle James? The shell. The shell. If you go over to St. James in Falls Church, you will see James standing there with a staff and his shell. The staff representing the uh, the pilgrimage to Santiago, but that shell is a symbol of James. Why? Because when the boat that was carrying the body of the apostle drew near to the shore of Spain, the story goes that there was a man riding a horse, and that horse, sensing the presence of the apostle, turned its head and ran directly into the sea and drove down into the water with the rider on it. And the disciples of James who were on the boat and the men standing on the shore watching this happen were horrified. The man had died. He had been drowned into the waters. And then, coming with force out of those waters was that horse with the man riding on it, now covered in barnacles and shells. The first miracle associated with the Apostle James. And since that day, the shell has become the symbol of the Apostle James. Ah, okay. The belief is that the, the bones of the Apostles, the Apostle were buried in James and forgotten, lost, for seven centuries. Okay? And in the eighth century, what happened in the year 711, friends? The year 711, Islam crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and conquered the Iberian Peninsula. It was at that time that a monk in the north, where Santiago is today, in the northeast, uh, the northwest side of Spain, was walking, saying his daily prayers, and saw in the earth a mound glowing with light. He began to dig that spot and uncovered a sarcophagus written, the Apostle James, on it. It was taken out and then the king uh, of Asturias was called in and he commanded that a church be built on that site. That became the location of Santiago de Compostela uh, where the pilgrims then began to come from all over the world. I would love someday to take the Institute of Catholic Culture on the pilgrimage of Santiago de Compostela. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Any other questions? That's too long. That's enough, right? God bless you. Thank you very much for coming tonight. All right. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.